Oh. Okay. If uh, if I recall correctly, where we left off last time, <laughs> um, we were speaking about design, but we were speaking about it in very um, broad terms, um, and you know, more concept-driven than specific things. And what I want to do now is I want to do two things today, two or possibly three things today, depending on, on how it goes, is one, to talk a little bit about more concrete things, all right? We, we talked about some of the things that are good, simplicity, uh, consistency, and we can talk about those things um, a little more specifically um, today. I also want to talk about multiple pages, like sort of before we were focusing more or less on one page at a time. We talked a little bit about navigation, so I suppose we got in there. Um, but um, I like to expand our scope to talk a little bit more about multiple pages. And then depending on the time, um, we will start talking about your project. So I hope you've read the materials. Um, and um, if you have not, be sure to read them for next week, for, for Tuesday. First of all, when we start talking about going from Single pages to multiple pages. Let's, let's, let's go, let's spiral out. Let's talk about the second thing, then the first thing, then the third thing. All right. When we talk about going to multiple pages as opposed to one pages, the big issue then, all right, Consistency. And sort of the, uh, a guiding principle for consistency, and maybe just another way to define it, uh, is that similar things look similar, different things look different. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. Uh, again, it's one of those things, though, that you know um, you sort of step back and, and have to think about it because otherwise you see a lot of sites that don't necessarily follow this, and, and you can run into problems. So, in other words, your links on the main navigation bar, they look the same. They ought to look the same. If you have a sub-navigation, those links ought to look the same as other sub-navigations, but different than the main navigation. And let's pull up our website, LCCC. And again, I, I'm not, I should turn the mic off for a second, but I'm not going to claim this is a great looking website. Pardon me? I don't know. I might have been. I'm not going to claim that this is a, a great website, but there are certain things that we can, we can learn for, from it. For example, here, main navigation, if you notice, it's in the same spot every page. It sort of anchors you down. This is a sub-navigation. And then there's further divided underneath that. No matter what section we go to, it follows that format. Sort of the home page for each of these different sections. Each of these sections kind of has a home page, and it follows sort of the same format with um, the sub-navigations and so on. So you wouldn't want these links looking like these. The fact that they look different differentiates them and therefore leads to understanding. Consistently also comes in play in so far as like where the logo is, that the search bar is always up here, that it, the logo, if you click, it is a link back to the home page and so on. Now one thing that, that you should remember is that consistency also 
to a degree relates to other sites on the web. All right? Jacob Nielsen, a very famous uh, person that talks about web design, said something to the effect of there's Nielsen's Law where your users spend more time on other websites than your website. All right? So therefore, it's good to follow sort of the conventions of the web. So, conventions for the web typically are things like that. The logo is a link back to the home page. Search box almost inevitably is in this section of the, pa uh, of the page. Were you shaking your head no or are you agreeing? Okay. Right. And you hate when it's not. Exactly. Why is that? Because you've learned. You know, web design within a site and within all the sites teaches you, maybe teaches is a wrong word, sets expectations in your head of where you're going to find things. And when you don't find things there, it, it angers you. All right? So, yeah. So, you would expect the search to be there. Things that are less important but probably should exist on every page are typically on a footer in the bottom. All right? And so on. So, within a website you want consistency, but you also want consistency between your site and all the other sites in the web. Now, one thing to remember, consistency doesn't mean identical. All right? If I say your pages should have a consistent layout, that doesn't mean that every page has the exact same absolute layout. For example, the home page on this site looks different than sort of the home page for a section of the site. And that looks different than There we go. That looks different than this page. If we're really going to break it down, and, you know, based on my time showing um, this website and talking about it, talking about the consistency, there are three basic page layouts on this site. There's the home page, which is unique, which kind of makes sense for the home page to be unique. That's your face to the world, all right? That, that's your storefront to the world, all right? Again, today we're quoting Nielsen a lot. Uh, green side of a website, the most expensive real estate on earth because organizations spend a lot of money designing and getting that right um, when it's only a small square um, of, of space. Because again, it's their face of the world. It's the first impression typically that people have. So it makes sense that the home page is going to be differently. There is a sort of a section home page that corresponds to each of these. So all of them look roughly like this. And then finally, there is what I'll call a content page that actually has the stuff. So there's sort of two level, levels of navigation and then you get into sort of the content pages. And almost all the content pages look like this. All right. So, if I say that there's a consistent layout, it's still consistent even though the three pages don't look exactly the same. What's consistent about it? The color scheme is consistent. The top level navigation is consistent. The footer is consistent. And the type is consistent. All right? So when I say things should be consistent from page to page to page, it doesn't mean that they need to be identical. All right? Um, when you do your project, we'll talk about this in terms of what we call wireframes. And wireframes are just little sketches, like you might draw on a napkin, um, you know, when you're having a meeting with someone that, that says where the, how the main pages are laid out. All right? For small websites, you may have just one wireframe. There may be just one layout. This is a big site with a lot of pages, and I would guess that if we looked at and analyzed all of these, that there'd be a total of like three wireframes, three basic designs, home page, section, home, 
and then content page. So again, there's consistency between them, and, but there's differences for that, for the unique nature of certain pages. One thing that you'll see a lot of times is on, on sites, there might be, for example, like a photo gallery page that has a different layout than the rest of the stuff. It might have a different sort of navigation with thumbnails and all that, simply because that page is sort of different than the rest of the, the content pages on the site. Okay. So consistency, similar things look similar, different things look different. Uh, the other thing that we talked about last time is the notion of branding, which I don't really like that word. I, 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 don't, I don't like, you know, you even hear people say, you know, you're, you have to have your own personal brand. It's like, I don't know what my personal brand is, you know. The, the Zellerverse, right. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I, 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 but, but you get the idea. It's a word that everyone knows or most people know, so we might as well use it. Branding, you give an image. And we talked about last time a lot about Apple doing that with the choices that you make. Now, um, one of the things in design is that things are a trade-off. And we talked about balancing between simplicity and complexity. The ultimate simplicity would be like just to have a few lines, few words on each page, but that would make it very difficult to navigate. If you had everything on your website on one page, which some of the bad examples that we saw apparently was trying to do that, all right, then you have a mess as well. So balancing between simplicity and complexity, that comes into how much content you have on the page, that comes into... Um, how much space you have between things, all right? And we notice, for example, even those choices were made with the brand and the brand image in mind. For example, Apple, a company that has a relatively small number of products, could afford to be more simple and more spacious in, uh, on the site. Whereas a company like Dell that has more products sort of has to have a denser design. And both of those sort of reflect the attitude that you get from the company. Apple, the one of elegance and simplicity. Dell, in that you have a lot of choices. So, let's talk about what are some practical things that we can do via CSS to do this and to accomplish this. Whoops. You're on camera for a minute. I hope everyone was, was looking alert and smiling. Oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> One of the things that you can do, by the way, is you can use multiple style sheets. All right? Remember, again, the whole notion of cascading style sheets is that there can be a bunch of style sheet rules, and they sort of trickle down from top to bottom. We notice that where you can put something in the tag for like the body. And then there can be a different style sheet for, um, or then there can be a different color for the header or a different color for the nav and, and so on down the line. And the more specific overrides it. If you have multiple style sheets that apply, the first one applies. If there's anything in the second that overrules it, that will take into effect. Well, how could you use that notion? Again, this site, and again, I don't know exactly how they did that, could have a single style sheet for every page because certain parts of this, the position of this, the color of the header, the color of the footer, and all that are the same. It could then have a different style sheet, a different secondary style sheet for the main page, a different secondary style sheet for the um, section pages, and then finally a different style sheet for the contact or content pages. You don't have to do that. One nice thing about CSS is if you put in a style rule and it doesn't apply to anything on the page, that's okay. Nothing gets that style rule. But one thing that you can do to sort of achieve this consistency without um, making the pages look identical is you can either carefully design a single style sheet that handles them, or you can actually break it down into multiple style sheets. Later on in the course, when we talk about mobile development, we'll talk about 
breaking down into multiple style sheets and having one for a mobile site and one for a desktop site. One of the key points of a website is to have legibility. And therefore, um, your color choices, having good contrasting color. So we've seen how you can make the background color and the text color look different. All right, Make sure you do that in a way that's legible. And make sure you do that in a way that is purposeful. Again, following the principle that like things should look the same, different things should look different. So, if you have a main navigation and a sub-navigation, those are different things. They ought to look different. And we've seen how we can go and put colors in. One of the things that helps us do that is selectors with CSS. And I think we talked about three or four different kinds of selectors. Let's review those. All right. The basic selector is an HTML tag. Where we can put in H1 and whatever's within brackets, those are the style rules that apply. That's the basic sort of selector, the first selector that we started with. Another thing that we can do is we can do something like this. What does that do? Targets all the links in the nav section. So if we do this, that is sort of the nesting. So we may not want every link on the page to look the same, right? Because similar things look similar, different things look different. But all the nav links, we might want to look the same. So we can use that selector to do that. We could then have links in a section, or let's say links in the form, have a different look by doing that. And then we could have links anywhere else have that look. Let me write this more legibly. All right, we can cascade this. For example, if we wanted all our links on our page to be red, all of them, where would we put the attribute for red? In A. So I could say A color red. If we wanted the ones in the navigation section not to be underlined, where would we put that? In the first selector. Text decoration none, I believe would do that. What if we wanted the links in the footer we changed our mind and didn't want all of them to be red. Well, if we want the links in the footer to be green. Links should always be green. If we do this then, what color will the nav links be? They'll be red. Right? Because the footer applies to links in the footer, the nav, we've not specified an attribute for the, the links in the nav. Therefore, the attributes on the link tag sort of cascades down. All right? So, we can do an actually, we can actually do quite a bit with this. All right? And this is largely because of HTML5. Prior to HTML5, you saw more of what I'm going to talk about now in a minute here. But because they've added extra structural tags like nav and header and footer, you can use those. 
Now, I'm going to explain to you other ways that you can do selectors. Because number one, you could be maintaining an old site. Maybe someone else created the site that didn't attend this class or something. And, uh, or it was done a while ago before HTML5 took effect. Or, uh, again, there might be some special circumstances even with HTML5 that you want to do that. And that is the notion of a class. and an ID. Difference between a class and an ID. Right. There should only be one thing that has that ID on the page. An ID is unique. All right. Should two people have the same student ID number? No. You'd be getting each other's grades and getting each other's bills and that would either be good or bad depending on which happened and who it happened to. All right. But overall it wouldn't be good for that to have happen. So an ID allows us to pinpoint one particular thing and say, hey, this is an exception. All right. Where I see this a lot you, uh, you could do this, uh, I've seen a couple different ways of doing this, is, for example, for a nonprofit organization. They may have their, uh, guess what link might have an ID on a nonprofit organization's navigation? Donate. Exactly. Because their main navigation might have this, that, this, that. So they're all the same except for nonprofit organizations, getting donations is like a really big deal. So they may make it six times the size and, and stand out in a different color and, and all that just to make it so that um, um, you can see it. Okay, this... I thought this was an example, but it, it really isn't. This is a site actually students in this class a few sections, a few uh, years ago did. They kind of did it, but they didn't do it with CSS. There's a donate button here. And they didn't make this one a different color. All right. So how do you do a style rule then for an ID? Well. You define it with a pound sign in front of it in the CSS. And then you can go in and say A ID equals and then give the name of the ID. If I do a war uh, if I want to do a class like warning. Instead of saying ID equals, I can say class equals. And the class attribute can be shared among several elements. Right? And if, if you think about it, again, the student analogy I think is good. You're the only one that has your ID number. Right? So the ID needs to be unique. Whereas you're not the only one in this class. So class can be shared between several people. So in the old days, before they had header and footer and, and nav and all that, what you did is you made divs and then you gave these IDs or classes to it to make it look a certain way. We can do more precise and we can actually get away from using classes and IDs to some degree by simply using our proper HTML5 and, and selectors. Okay? But there's still exceptions. For example, the donate button. That you would have that one special link that you want to look way different than everything else and you could go and do that. Now, the other thing that we've played with that is key to legibility, because legibility is the issue, and I will say that modern browsers do a much better job of zooming in 
on the content. It used to be real easy to break the browser zoom feature by simply giving an absolute pixel size. All right. Notice when we've done um, font sizes, we've used M's, which is a good idea because M makes it easier to resize. But even if you use an absolute pixel, a lot of the resizing and zooming allows you to, um, uh, you know, uh, expand it if you can't particularly read it. So there's that using a good contrasting colors and using good legible fonts. Uh, one thing about fonts, um, the two main categories of fonts are serif and sans serif. And there, I guess there's a third class of fonts <laughs> that um, um, I, I guess for lack of a better word are called decorative fonts. Uh, those are the fancy script and everyone's favorite comic sans. All right. If you want to have fun, I won't do it because it has a bad word on the title and I don't want the FCC coming after me, especially now that I'm getting a kickstart endorsement. <laughs> but Google Comic Sans McSweeney if you want to read an article. McSweeney is kind of a humor magazine. or uh, Actually, it's a, more of a, a writing magazine, but it does have a lot of humor in it. But... Um, the font Comic Sans wrote an angry letter to McSweeney's about how it hates being picked on. So it's kind of entertaining. All right. And of course, there's one font that had a movie made out of it. Does anyone know of a font that had a movie made out of it? I'm, I'm, <laughs> the Times of the New Romans? Uh, good answer. No, that, that's not correct. Well, it may be correct. I haven't seen that one. No. Is it a popular movie? It is the most popular movie about typography ever. <laughs> it's Helvetica. Oh, I was going to say Helvetica. Yeah. yeah, there is a documentary movie. It's called Helvetica. If you have Netflix, um, it's, it's, I would say it's worth watching. But um, then again, I also say reruns of Green Acres is worth watching too. Uh, that the old sitcom from the 60s. So take a peek at it. It's interesting. And, and they talk a lot about legibility versus expression in fonts, which is like the big controversy. In other words, should your only goal be to make your site easy to read or should you, your goal be to be expressive with your typography, to be expressive of the brand? And the answer to that question, as is the answer to almost all those questions, is what? It depends. It depends on a particular site. Or, again, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of website. This is the movie Helvetica actually talks about other graphic designs like album covers and things like that, business cards. You know, if you're doing a business card, yeah, you probably want it plain and simple and easy to read. If you're doing a concert poster or a album cover uh, or um, a book cover or something like that, you might go for um, a, a more elaborate, a more expressive approach. Again, the things we talk about in design are guidelines more than rules. All right? And so how you decide to put as far as simple, complex, um, plain or decorative really depends on the particular project. But, alas, there are two kinds of fonts, serifs and sans serif. Let me pop up Microsoft Word. What is the difference between a serif and a sans serif font? The little thing. Exactly. The little, the, the little serif, right. With and without serif, right. If I remember from my two years of high school French, sans means without in French. What does serif mean? Serif just means serif. There's, there's no word for it in English other than serif. Right. All right, so let's go here and 
You can tell at a glance. All right. Is that a serif or a sign serif font? Serif. How do we know it is serif? Got these little order thingies that the letter sits on. Let's see. I don't think Helvetica was licensed to Microsoft. So you know what they did? They made up their own that looks almost exactly like it. Ariel. All right. I saw a uh, uh, I saw on Tumblr there was the Little Mermaid, the hipster Little Mermaid that says, "My name is an Arielis Helvetica." Yeah. So let's put these side by side, or or on top of each other, and we'll do Ariel, which is a common sans serif font, and we'll do Times New Roman, which is a common popular. All right. Those both look good. Can you make some observations about them? Do, do either of those evoke a particular feeling? All right. Sans serif typically has a more contemporary feel to it. What would you say the serif font would, would be? Elegant, classic. All right. Oh, what they tell you use sans serif font, so like you, you didn't like use wingdings or something. Yeah. Yeah. Now notice on this site, there's a mix of. Serif and sans serif. They probably only use two fonts total here, I would guess. Can you look at, can you come to some observation about when they use serif and when they use sans serif, just by looking at this? I know your designers. Oh, I, don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we can obviously, because I'm a fa fashion icon, <laughs> right? Okay. Here's what I observe: smaller font is done in sans serif. Bigger font is done in serif. Yeah, it is. Like these are small. So they're in sans serif. This is small, so it's in sans serif. This is big, so it's in serif. This is bigger than that, so it's in sans serif. Or it, that's serif. Smaller text where? Yeah, but that's still bigger. This smaller text here, this body text here, is still bigger than this text over here. All right. As a general observation, and we're going to go to the Wall Street Journal after this, but as a general observation, sans serif text is more readable for smaller font, and serif text is more readable for larger font. All right. The serifs actually help people to see the words and read the words better, but they don't scale as well. All right. 
Wall Street Journal actually does more of what I expected the New York Times to do. I'll have to remember to do the, use this example next time. This is a lot more clear cut. Headlines, serif. Body of the article, sans serif. And that's a pretty typical usage. Again, it's like colors though on a website. You don't necessarily want to mix 10 of them, but you have a couple of them just for a little bit of visual variety and for the fact that sans serif has one look, serif has another, little visual, and, and sans serif scales better than serif. Now if we go to Apple site, I am sure that it's all sans serif. Why? Again, that's where we're getting into sort of the, I don't want to say mood, but sort of the feel of it. This, this has a very clean, contemporary, modern feel to it, and therefore sans serif is, is used. All right? So, what, do you, what can you do for legibility? Again, make sure you pick good color combinations. Make sure you pick between a couple different fonts. All right? Can you do a page all in one font? Sure. Can you mix two fonts? Sure. Beyond that though, there better be a good reason for it if you start getting into three, four, five different fonts. Otherwise, it's just confusing to the user. All right? Okay. And again, we can do that in selecting this with, um, you know, with any of the selectors that we talked about. So ID, class, or HTML. The other category of font are sort of called the decorative fonts. It's sort of like none of the above, like Bauhaus. So Black Adder, a, a great television show, if you've, ever, if you've seen it. It's a BBC show. Um, Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I just did that. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's actually Brad. Now, when would you use these sorts of decorative fonts? Yeah, not too often is an acceptable answer. When there's a very specific look that you can see. I, I guess there are personal preferences that come into play a little bit here. These kind of fonts generally for me look amateurish. All right. If you have something real specific, okay, maybe you do that. But as a general rule, you know, I would tend to avoid these sort of fonts. All right, they look cheesy, they look um, amateurish, and so on. Yeah, a title or a logo, right. Like, um, if you notice, like the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, that is... I mean, that is, I mean, that's been their... their what would you call that, masthead for years that's identifiable as them. Or Coca-Cola. All right. That, you know, that has, that has a certain look to it and it's been like that for, for years. So, yeah. You know, that, if, if you had sans serif Coca-Cola, that would just look weird. All right. It just wouldn't look to add up. Can we explore the world of ah? Uh, not right now. If you're good, you can do it in the lab. All right. So, we've given out, I've thrown out a lot of guidelines. And one of the things I'm trying to impress is we can talk in general rules, but the specifics about like when to do this or when to do that depends on the specific application you're working in. 
some pretty good general observations and the ones we have I think are good if we're talking about just a basic business website. If you're talking about a more sort of outlier site like a site for an artist, a site for a band, um, and so on, then maybe the palette is extended into some more unconventional things. All right. Now, I guess that brings me to the point where I want to start talking about your project. And we'll get so far into this and we'll go in uh, into more detail next Tuesday. We can't, we can only talk in guidelines for web development sites, all right? For, for, for design principles. We can only talk in terms of general statements like, you know, generally it's good to do, a good guideline is this, a good guideline is that. But there's a lot of variance within there as far as a particular project you're working in. So instead of there being a set of rules that we say a well-designed website has these criteria, we take a different approach. And that approach is looking at the goals of the website and that will dictate a lot of our design decisions. That will dictate what content we're going to have on the site, it's going to dictate how we're going to organize the site, and so on. All right? There's two groups of folks that need, that, that have goals that need to be satisfied for the website to be successful. One is the organization making the site, right? They're not making the site just for the heck of it. They have some goals in mind, all right? What would the goal, let's say, for a college's website be? Pardon me? All right, give information about the college. And, and why, would, why would a college want to give information about it? So people will enroll, all right. Now, thing to keep in mind is, and we're going to talk about this, and we'll talk about it a little more, there, uh, there is, is what are called strategy and tactics. I mean, even if you're talking military terms, strategy and tactics. Strategy is the end result that you want, all right? Tactics are what you're going to do to try to achieve that. So we want to develop a strategy to enroll more people at our college. How do we do that? One way is to provide information about the pro uh, programs, all right? What would be another way of promoting your college to get more enrollment. If getting more enrollment is the goal, providing information about the program is one of the things that we could do. What are some other things that we could do? Give away free stuff. Away free stuff okay. Always a good idea. What's another thing we could do? Viral marketing? All right. On the website. Have a game, maybe. Pictures. Show how nice the campus is. Show how good the facilities are. Celebrity endorsements. What 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 are those called for a college? They typically don't call celebrity endorsements. Testimonials? Famous alumni. All right, you know, go to um, you know, go to certain sites, and you'll see. Did you know that you know? And a list of several people went there. Here are some famous alumni, and that's a way of getting it across. All right, testimonials, even if they're not famous. All right, alumni can tell a story about how the school helped their life. You know, and can talk about like the situation they were in and, and what, what happened at the school and so on. Employers could say, gee, we hired three graduates from Lorraine Community College and they all worked out great. All right? So that would be another way. All right? Now, here's an interesting thing. There's a lot of ways that we could 
promote the college to try to get it to appear more attractive. We could talk about our tuition rates compared to the tuition rates at other colleges. We could talk about the excellence of our faculty. <clears throat> we could talk about a lot of things. We could talk about the experience of the faculty. All right. Um, do we want to do all the things that we can think of? Probably not. All right. We could probably think of a whole bunch of things that could potentially promote our college and get, help us achieve our goals of getting more enrollment. But we're not going to do all of them. Why not? We don't have any celebrities. Okay, we might not have any. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. No, we, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you define celebrity. One thing I will say, though, is, and I've seen this used in some of our marketing literature, and I've seen it in other places, there are a lot of famous community college graduates. Maybe not from here, but from community colleges. Tom Hanks, I think, recently came out with a testimonial. He would not be where he was without community colleges. The star of the great TV sitcom Bosom Buddies and uh, among, other, uh, among other things. Um, I think George Lucas went to a community college, if I'm not mistaken. So if we can't find a testimonial of a per specific celebrity, then we could speak of community colleges in general. Uh, the president has said a lot of great things about community colleges. And on the other side of the political spectrum, uh, our governor, Kasich, a uh, Republican, has said good things about community colleges. Pardon me? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Now, at any rate, um, so, yeah, so that would be one reason why. What's another reason? Even if we did have a celebrity, even if, even if, if you know, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know who that is. Uh, even if uh, William Shatner went here, you know, what would be another reason why we wouldn't use all of the techniques to promote the college? Yeah, it's overkill, right? It's overkill. So, how do you decide what to use and what not to use? How do you decide when to hold them and when to fold them? Talk to people, talk to who? The people that would be using the site. Now, would one method of getting people, would one method of promoting the college be effective for every kind of person out there? Probably not. Would one anything be good for everyone? The answer is almost always no. There's, there's different things that appeal to different people. But what you could do is you could look at different groups of people who might be visiting your site and sort of talk to them, look for common themes, and look for things to target that specific group. All right? For example, for a displaced worker, you might have success stories of people that lost their job, went here, and got a better job. All right? That would be very compelling, I would think, to someone in that position. For parents of people, all right, you might talk about the cost, and you might talk about the university partnership program, you know, where you could take two or three years in a particular uh, area and finish up your degree at a university. You know, the, a, as a parent of two college-age uh, students, yeah, the cost is an important factor that you would consider. Um, for some, some are looking for specific programs, so information about the programs. So, this is where you have the organization has its goals. The user, and I don't want to talk about the user as though they're one person. The groups of users out there have their own goals, and there needs to be sort of an overlapping of that. So, what design is, is figuring out the right mix of stuff that's going to help you achieve your goals as the organization creating the site, 
and yet allow for your typical sorts of users to help achieve their goals all right in visiting that so the design that we're going to have is not visual driven we're not going to start off talking about what's the best color for our website or whatever we're going to start talking about what the goals are and really defining those goals specifically the more specific we can define a goal the better we can address it all right and we're not going to just look at the goal for one kind of person we're going to look we're going to create our we're going to we're going to separate our audience into groups now that's not going to be perfect right because every person's an individual well yeah you can't divide, develop a website for each of the eight billion people in the world right but you can look and say who are the kinds of people that are typically visiting our site what would their goal specifically be and again you can find them you can talk to them and you can use that information to start deciding well what's going to be on our website how are we going to organize the website and then move from there so if you have not already read the documents about the semester project please do so for next Tuesday and that's where we'll pick up on Tuesday. All right. Thank you.